I, I'll introduce myself again, my background and uh, books that I've published and uh, my course offerings. Books that I've written in the past few years, and this is my most recent one on quiet, quiet woodworking. This talks mostly about the, uh, the transition to hand tools and the advantages of uh, hand tool woodworking compared to uh, full-on machinery and power tools. Of course, there is a intermediate hybrid stage. And this is my journey from my former high-tech career to my uh, woodworking furniture making career. This is a starting a woodworking business book, actually. And this is a, a whole book on uh, on a progression of uh, of a design to a piece of furniture. So this covers uh, very good photography on uh, all the steps and techniques I use from my design stage, the formative stage, and then uh, what I what I uh, criteria I use to design furniture right through to the making of the furniture. So these books are available at my woodskills.com website. I have several woodworking courses from a basic woodworking course right through to furniture design course and right through to a design and making course that, it, that you actually get the book with the, uh, with the course and something on Kamiko. Well, this is a, this is a, this is a shooting board. It's the it's most basic one that I've, uh, one of my earlier ones. I did an article for Fine Woodworking a number of years ago, and they came up and we created a bunch of bench accessories, uh, several more bench accessories to be able to work on the workbench book holding specifically. One of the uh, accessories in the article was a shooting board. So we actually created two shooting boards while they were here filming and photographing. So this is an attachment for 45 degree angle, but if you're not, uh, so this is an attachment and it bolts into here. So it's something I designed several years ago. And I have another one for case miters that I, uh, I'll show you in a bit on a different shooting case. So let's assume, let's assume we have a piece of wood. One thing about <coughs> workshops, and to workshops is I, I, I reorganize things uh, periodically, so I've just finished reorganizing. I have a saw tool at the other end. I haven't even to talk about saw as much, but there's a saw tool cabinet all around. It's a fairly large workshop, two, two levels, and I, uh, I just split up my uh, pegboard into two portions, and that's my, because I ran out of space. And that end. So it's just a, it's a, it's a work in, uh, in progress is what it is. And you tailor it, you keep tailoring it to the type of work you do. Uh, you'll find that whatever you, uh, it's never set in stone, the design, whatever you've designed. I mean, for the most part, I haven't really changed much. So I've got some stationary machines around the periphery and the workbenches are, I think they're optimized to where I like them now, but I've changed the uh, tool cabinets. I've added, uh, I've added depth to the uh, doors so I can store more tools. I've added this central part portion, store more tools, and I've had to add these, uh, these custom shelving to store even more tools. And again, I've had to build up the, uh, the peg boards and, and build up some cabinets. So it's, again, it's a work in progress. So I have to actually have photographs of what this uh, workshop, I've been in this workshop for 23 years now, 22, 23 years. So I have photographs of what it looked like, and it was hardly anything here way back when. I just said what I needed. I think I only had, I didn't even have these workbenches. I had a, another workbench that I built uh, in the early 2000s. It's, uh, it's in the lower level now. And, uh, but I've, and I have a rolling cart. I, yesterday, uh, yesterday, I talked about a chisel rack for fine detail chisels. And I, this is another of my racks, the whole bevel edge. Chisels. Now, what I like about these racks, this rack and this rack, is that they're portable. So this works for me because I have I have two workbenches, and I like to when I'm working at one workbench, I can I can bring it over and then uh, and then move everything over to wherever I'm working. So I tend to like these uh, these custom uh, uh, chisel racks. So they, this is customized for my two well, it's portable, and it has a little addition for a, an awl. And these are the uh, chisels I use more often than not. Uh, I do have other chisels. I have Morris chisels and I have premium uh, chisels, uh, Richter ch chisels that have a very, very small land. The land is the, uh, it's one of the small ones. The land is the, uh, I'll show you, is the side, the side of the chisel. Now you want, 
if you're doing detail work and uh, dovetail work, you really want a small land because if you don't have a small land, you tend to mar the wood or dent the wood whenever you're working in a small uh, area. Of, uh, if you're working in a small area, this is one of the few drawers that I, uh, I can disassemble and assemble just for demonstration. So if you're working in a small area, uh, maybe I won't use this one. Yeah, something like this. If you're using and working in a small area, you'll notice this has very beefy or very tall lands the side of the uh, chisel. So this doesn't really work well when you're uh, when you're in here because it sort of mars everything. It's because it's so wide, it tends to mar the uh, the edges of the wood. So these are not the type of chisels I would use when I'm when I'm cleaning out dovetails, for example. I'll put this away and I'll show you. I'll show you this in uh, comparison. This is a Richter chisel. And this has a super, super fine land, almost non-existent. Where the bevel edge meets the bottom of the chisel, it's almost non-existent. So it doesn't, there isn't a surface there to mar the, uh, uh, it lends itself well to cleaning out dovetails. Although they have dedicated skew chisels that you can work with also. So that's, I purchased this set for that reason. And then, of course, I have the uh, the detail chisels. These are parent chisels. They're detail, and this actually this works really, really well. They don't. Uh, they have again that very small land, and they blend themselves really, really well to cleaning up uh, inlay and and dovetail. I don't think they're available any longer. It was a, a custom set of. Uh, Detail chisels, Young Chan. Interestingly enough, I had a I had a course in about 2004 with Young Chan, a week long course on on uh, on furniture making, woodworking, and he's the, uh, the designer of these these this chisels, detail chisel set. So this is something that I talk about in my my hand tool class on creating uh, half blind dovetails. And if you're doing any drawers, this the uh, this is the type of dovetail you'd want the half blind for, for attaching the drawer front to the drawer sides. Let's get back to the, uh, the shooting board and how it works. So the shooting board, what it does is it, it, uh, it uh, creates a, a 90, 90 degree edge if you're using uh, just a straight fence, a 90 degree edge. With uh, in conjunction with a long sole plane. Now this particular shooting board is an earlier one, so what I would use is uh, this was the kind of plane I would use back then. And it's designed for it's a right hand orientation. So if I'm you notice that that sound is actually it's individual shavings coming off. And this creates a perfect 90 degree smooth surface. Now, because it's a right hand orientation, I have problems with it. I tend not to use it as much as uh, it's one of the probably one of the uh, shooting boards I've developed for uh, fine woodworking articles. I had to create both a left hand and, and a right hand one. And this is uh, this works really well. A shooting board along with uh, a long sold, uh, in this case, four plane because it's uh, as long as the, uh, the side and the bottom of the plane are 90 degrees to each other. So it works really well if you're starting out and you're making your first shooting board. And I, again, I offer plans for that at woodskills.com. So you can use either that or use a, uh, a bevel up jack. It's a little shorter than this guy. Also, this works equally well. The noise. We talk about how these work. People always ask, uh, "Aren't you actually shaving part of the fence away every time?" Not, not so because uh, because of this little gap at the bottom, it keeps the uh, the sole from from the edge just just enough to avoid hitting the fence. So I talk about that in my course and I explain how that works. But that's the premise. This little gap at the bottom is a little protrudes just enough to keep the, the sole of the plane away from the. Uh, the fence. So I'll put this away. So the the shooting board itself is uh, 
So working with hand tools, really, really neat to make one of these, build one of these. They're very straightforward to make. I offer plans. Uh, it comes with it. You can create it with attachments, and that's the difference with, uh, with mine. Though this would be a 45. So this works. Uh, bolting this down. So if I'm doing a 45, again, I would uh, grab all of these. So this cleans the, uh, I need to readjust the, the depth of the uh, blade. It's a little too. A little too thick. Where's that adjustment? Yeah, it's 45 degree adjustment. It's 45 degrees. So, so I'll put that aside. Again, if you're building a basic one, you can use one of your existing uh, long sole planes to uh, use the shooting board. Now, the, uh, the more recent shooting board I'm using, and I'll show you that. This is my uh, my most recent go-to shooting board, and I'll tell you what I've done with this. This is actually the uh, one of the original shooting boards with left-hand orientation that I've created for the fine woodworking article way back when. And this uh, this attachment uh, does case miters. So do I have one here? Yeah, this is uh, an example of a case miter. This is uh, 45 degrees. So this would be uh, a small compartment. A box a drawer and so it's important to have the, uh, the corners of 45 degrees and that's accomplished through the uh, through this uh, this attachment so if I'm not using the attachment I can uh, switch it up with So if I push this away, this would be uh, the other attachment. Uh, again, this does uh, this does case miters and this has face miters. So a face miter, uh, an idea. Uh, this is a this is a face miter. So the uh, the idea is the same. Now the difference between this shooting board and the one I showed you earlier. This is a uh, <laughs> It's a dedicated shooting plane. You can purchase this from uh, Vertas or Lee Nielsen still, I think they still market it. And it uh, rides, uh, the original version of this shooting board was, uh, it didn't have a track, it had the track, but not this, not this portion of the track to lock the uh, the shooting plane in. And you can see how it's set up, how beautifully it glides. So this, what this does, this system, what it does is it removes that variable of having to keep the shooting uh, plane against the fence. So that relieves that issue. And then it's just a matter of holding the component against uh, the fence and then uh, gliding this back and forth. It works, it's beautiful. It's a really a, a real step above the uh, the other one, but the other one, I, I used the conventional one that I've shown earlier for, for many, many years. Actually, I was trying to avoid purchasing one of these and an opportunity to get one came up, so why not? And this again, it's a uh, case miter and it's set for 45. So, so I, this is critical to check this to make sure it's 45. So, so that's that attachment. And you'll notice that this uh, this shooting board is in left hand orientation. I'm left handed, so it's the one I use for the most part. And I've got three others that. Maybe another left-handed one, I'm not sure. So, so I'm not doing uh, face or case miters. I'm doing 90-degree corn edges. And that's, that's the beauty of this. So that's a perfect 90-degree. Uh, uh, if you're measuring uh, for square or, uh, or an angle, specific angle, a little technique or a little tip is is to not have the uh, the gauge against the wood because it's very easy not to see the uh, the gaps. So keep it away just enough, and then try to determine if the gap is uniform from one end to the other, like I'm showing now. So just like I'll exaggerate that. That's what I'm talking about. That gap. 
bring it down to where you can actually see the gap. Because if you have it too close, it sort of masks the ridges and the valleys. So that's a, that's a shooting board. So much more to cover. We haven't even touched on sharpening. I talked about a bench hook, a shooting board, the different hand planes. I've shown you maybe three or four, and I've talked about the layout of the workbench and everything else. And I haven't really got into larger saws. I use panel saws a lot and uh, larger back saws. And these are more fine saws. This is actually a Japanese uh, Tezuki. So this works on a pull stroke. I tend to use this. Uh, I also offer a class on a course on Kamiko. This is an example of Kamiko. So I picked this up a few years ago and I, uh, I teach it in a class and I've given sessions and lectures on Kamiko and I did some work for Lee Valley. I did some, some sessions for Lee Valley uh, and a whole class on, on uh, creating Kamiko. Now they, they have different patterns for motifs and this is a different one and newer one I was experimenting with. But the, uh, I'm just not going to delve into that too much today. Now, the other thing I mentioned yesterday is using tool wax or a paraffin wax block to uh, keep your planes lubricated and uh, keep them from, uh, keep the rust away too. So I tend to wipe this on the, on the bottoms of my, uh, or on the, not the bottoms, but the, uh, in this case, it is the bottom. It looks like the side, but it's the bottom. You glide better. So I tend to use that. Uh, I really, really take care of my tools because I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I like to only purchase tools once. I, I purchase uh, premium hand tools for the most part, uh, hand planes, chisels. And in the past, I, uh, I've always actually gone towards uh, more expensive premium tools, but now I really understand the value of uh, premium tools. If you need to resell the tools, you get a better price too, of course, much better price. And when I mentioned yesterday about some of the hand planes, I think the uh, Lee Nielsen, uh, I have both a, a nine and a half and a 60 and a half, which is a standard angle. I think oh, this one's completely available now, but I don't know if they're still making this 60 and a half. I don't think the demand was there. It's a standard angle block. And uh, I know Veritas has one. So I think uh, people never, never really understood its application. The marketing is really geared towards uh, low angle block planes. But this, I, I use it as a small smoother. I use it for a small detail work, along with an apron plan. So. Unfortunately, I can't get into any. I don't have enough time to get into everything else. I covered a scrub and uh, the long sole planes, four, four and a half. Of course, we have spoke shaves. I was just using some yesterday to create some. Uh, lately, I've been working on uh, a few charcuterie boards to make my wife happy, and, and uh, she's really. Over the, over the moon with what I've done. It's the most simple thing, but I work the ends, I sculpt the ends with, uh, with spoke shapes so they can grip the ends better. These are the way, uh, just quickly cover. This is a standard, if you, uh, you invest in a mallet, this is what a conventional mallet looks like. And this is uh, a more different style of mallet. It's, uh, it actually does the same thing, but because it's the, it's, it has a smaller footprint, it's, you can be you can be much more accurate with it. So I tend to use this a lot. And I use this one, it's smaller. But I would, uh, if you're investing in, in mallets, try not to get too large a mallet. You're better off with a small one. Because you, can, uh, you can pinpoint what you need to hit a chisel. My go-to ruler is a hook rule, still available at Thruli Valley. This one is a Veritas, might be available in Canada, at least a Busy Bee. You know, you don't have to concern yourself with uh, if you're using a conventional ruler and you're marking, uh, you're transferring measurements, or you're marking, marking the end. You don't have to worry about the error at the end from uh, from either getting it straight on or too far or too far back. And if you're creating multiples, it creates an issue with the compatibility. So by using a hook rule, that eliminates that hole, removes that error. So I have two or three of these or four of these now at every workbench. And I, I think this particular one is maybe 20 years old. So I keep everything in good shape. I, I don't think I'd be able to do much without this. Yesterday, I talked about some of the tools I created over time. This is a, a depth, uh, adjust the depth uh, guide. So I can determine the depth of uh, some holes or mortises. 
So I created these, a bunch of these, uh, using exotic woods, in this case, uh, tiger maple. I talked about some combination points and some of the other tools I've created, some uh, more recent uh, marking gauges. And uh, the earlier version of marking gauges, actually these are still available for the most part, some of these, but they're, uh, this one uh, lends itself well to, to tenons because it has both points for the uh, both sides of the tenon. So you can adjust them both individually. Our levels. I think everybody understands how level works. Some antique level I have. It's a little small, just to demonstrate to show people the quality of uh, the quality invested in hand tools uh, 120, 150 years ago. This is all the parts are replaceable. So I'll stop here, and I hope you've enjoyed this uh, these two sessions. If you have any questions, just email me or my wood skill site. My, I have an Instagram, a Wood Skills Mag. I have a YouTube channel that I periodically post. Uh, and my, uh, I really, really update my Instagram channel with posts and reels almost every the second day or every day. My YouTube channel, my YouTube channel. I mentioned my Wood Skills site, my blog, and 